following program is a presentation of Grace Chapel, Tullahoma. Grace Chapel is a non-denominational church focused on the Christian fellowship of believers in an environment committed to teaching the entire counsel of God. Grace Chapel teaches verse by verse through the Bible on Sunday mornings at 9.45 a.m. and on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. For more information on Grace Chapel, feel free to visit our website, www.gracechapeltelahoma.com or call 931-581-3294. So we're going to look at the geologic column now. That's what I mean when I say the geologic column. That's a famous picture from the outlook at Grand Canyon. You see the strata. It's just self-evident. You can see there's layers of rock. You can see they've been worn away in some kind of erosion process, right? Sediment, they're sedimentary. That's a sedimentary layers. Those are sedimentary layers of rock. That canyon is created by the depositing of rock in a process that must have included water to mix mud and create layers. And they're arranged that way, self-evidently. They're presumed to represent material deposited over time. Who made that presumption? James Hutton. The first diagram of the column, the first attempt by any scientist to try to document what is the column, what does it look like, was done in the 1800s. Now understand, what they're saying is we can create a map of what the columns of the earth look like and this is the map that you will find anywhere on the earth. That was the, the intent. That was what they tried to do. Here's what it looks like. This is back from that age. You can see some of the names probably pop out at you there. Things like the Jurassic period or the Mississippian or the Pennsylvanian or the Permian or the Tri Triassic period. These are names that were given to these strata and they also are corresponding now to ages of time. So the Jura Jurassic period of the earth is a layer and it refers to a past history, a past period of time in which that layer was supposedly deposited, right? Now look at this column. I want you, to, you can probably see it better on that TV screen maybe, but look at some of the numbers on that column. 65 million years, 135, 190, 225. That's pretty precise. That's pretty darn precise. They, have a, they seem to have figured out exactly where points in history, points in time, have changed and the layers have been deposited in some new way as a result of some change in the world, right? That's pretty good. How did they get those numbers? This happened in the 1800s. No rock dating, no fossil insights. The guy who wrote this just put the numbers on the paper. You look at me like, no, that's crazy, Steve. We don't do that kind of stuff. No, that's what we did. This is from the 1800s. And we still today use these numbers. These, they haven't changed. We still say that the Jurassic period happened about 200 million years ago because that number showed up on a chart in the 1800s. So when I look at this, it's conceived before rock dating methods. Dates were assumed. Layers, by the way, are not the same everywhere. Do you know this column does not exist anywhere in the world the way it's depicted right here? I'll go anywhere in the world and dig a channel and look at the side of a, of a cavern or of a cliff and I'll find some of those layers. They're identified, by the way, by the, by the contents of the strata, the color, the, the kind of um, uh, structure of rock that are there, the, the makeup of the rock and the fossils primarily. So we can go find these layers, but I'll go to one part of the world and I'll find the Jurassic layer on top of the Triassic layer, but then I'll go somewhere else and the Triassic layer is on top of the Jurassic layer. And then I'll go to another place and three of those layers aren't even there at all. And then I'll go to another place, and they're all in a reverse order. There's nowhere on earth that you actually find this the way it's depicted. This is sort of an idealistic view. It's not the actual way it exists anywhere. And it's different everywhere you go. But this is the standard. And how do they explain those differences? Well, there was an erosion moment in the past, and that's why a certain layer was taken away and we can't see it. Or there was this flipping of the strata at some point in the history of the earth, and that's why these are upside down. And so on. Convenient explanations. Is there any science to justify or to explain or verify those assumptions? No. There wasn't any science when it started. <laughs> it's all assumption. Commonly now it's used to date fossils. This is back to the radioisotopic dating point I made a moment ago. Today, if I find a fossil in the ground, the way I date the fossil, according to the science we use today, is I note which layer it's in. So if it's in the layer that we have called the Jurassic layer, then by definition, that fossil is 200 million years old. I don't date it. Can I do any kind of dating on a fossil? Well, it's not rock. 
and it's too old for carbon dating? And so the answer is no. You cannot date fossils, period. They're too old, according to the theory, and they're not rock, so you can't date a fossil. Not directly. How do you date them then? By the rock they're found in. But do we date the rock? No, because the theory, the, the practice of it is no longer considered necessary. So what do I do? Well, I just note what layer it's in, look at my little chart, that layer is the Jurassic layer, bingo, it's a 200 million year fossil, I tell Time Magazine, and they print it on their cover page. You think I'm being cynical, but that's exactly how it works. Exactly how it works today. You've been told that the fossil is 200 million years old because some guy in the 1800s attached that number to a layer of dirt, and ever since then, scientists have been saying it. You know, if you say something enough, it becomes true to the people who hear it. Ages were determined by the location of certain index fossils. So if I go into a layer today and I can't clearly make out the Jurassic period, it's not clear, it's too muddy, the, 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 the layers are a little mixed up, or maybe it's not there at all and I'm having trouble finding it. And that's true. You know, this isn't precision. If I go to the side of a mountain, I'm not going to necessarily see everything nice and clean and neat, right? But I find a fossil, a certain kind of fossil. When I find a certain fossil in the ground, I say, you know what, that fossil is usually found in the Jurassic period. So that fossil must tell us where the Jurassic period occurred in this column, even though the dirt doesn't match the Jurassic period dirt we're used to seeing elsewhere. <coughs> so the fossil is used to index the column. Follow me? How do fossils get formed though? Well, in the theory, an animal dies, falls to the ground or lays on the ground, and over time, mud covers it up, and as that mud develops and covers it up, over time, it eventually seals it in a tomb in which it can be preserved. So, ages are determined to be based on the fact that if a certain animal was understood to exist in the Jurassic period, let's say, uh, make an example of something you all would recognize, Tyrannosaurus rex. So the Tyrannosaurus rex is a certain animal, an extinct animal that's understood to have lived during the Jurassic period, because that's where we have found its fossil in some places. Then I go to another place and I find the fossil of that same animal, but it's not in the Jurassic layer, or there is no Jurassic layer in that place. Never mind, not a problem. I'm going to say that it is still the Jurassic period because it is a Tyrannosaurus rex, and Tyrannosaurus rex has been associated with the Jurassic period. Ergo, this must be the Jurassic period. So the fossil becomes the index for knowing what column I'm looking at. But wait a minute, if the theory says that things started simple, and got more complex, and that's why we see different kinds of animals layered in the ground, all the way up to and including hominids, animals that are uh, like apes, for example. If that's what the theory says, then it should c be the case that I should always find the layering in that way. And so the Jurassic period would always be somewhere in the middle with that higher order animal, but not quite modern animals. And then and wherever I find it, that tells me when I'm looking at the Jurassic period. So today a fossil's age is determined by the strata in which it's found, but wait a minute, we just said the strata is determined by what the, where the fossil is. That's a catch-22. Fossils are only found in sedimentary layers of rock, never in igneous rock. Only igneous rock can be dated. We try to date the closest rock to produce results consistent with the geologic column, but we've kind of given up on that because it doesn't work. That column exists nowhere on Earth in the way it's represented. Layers can be missing or flipped or in random order. Dates can vary wildly with any kind of true rock dating, and the geologic column and the index fossils are the gold standards for determining dates and for each other. What I'm getting at is this. When it's convenient to say we're in the Jurassic period and therefore these things must be 200 million years old, that's what we do. But when we come over here and there is no Jurassic period represented in the rock, we look for the fossils and then we say that's where the Jurassic period is. But over here, how did we know how old the fossil was? Because we said it was in the Jurassic period. Over here, how do we know we're in the Jurassic period? Because that's where the fossil was. It's circular logic. It's whatever we need it to be. So today, when I go out and do geology as a student, in geo in, as geology student, for example, and I'm digging in the ground and I come across a fossil, I'd go to my book and I'd say, according to my book, this fossil is always found in the Jurassic period. Ah, we're in the Jurassic period here. Then I go somewhere else and I find a new fossil, something I've never seen before, and I say, well, I wonder how old this is. And they'll say, well, which strata is it in? Oh, it's in the, uh, it looks like the Jurassic strata. Okay, well, then it must have come from 200 million years ago. There's no absolutes here. It's all relative for whatever I need in order to come to the conclusion I want. That's how we date today. If you're like me, the first time I heard this stuff, 
it seemed so bizarre, so unscientific, I had to assume that it's wrong, that what I'm hearing is wrong, that it's not this way, that science is better than that. Scientists aren't that deceived. They certainly would see this for themselves and realize this is nonsense. Clearly, there's something missing. And of course, I went out from the room with that perspective and did my own homework. And then I came back astounded that that is exactly how it works. It's still, mind, but it's still boggling my mind today, even now, that we still think like this. It's a proof in and of itself of how much of this area we call science, this evolution theory, is based on a desire to believe, not on objective efforts to find the truth. Present day forces don't do this. Back to our original point when we talked a minute ago about the fact that we can't observe anything from the theory in progress today. Here's another one of those examples. There is no evidence in the world today of fossilization, not in the way the theory says it happens. The theory says that throughout the history of the Earth, we've seen layers after layers of animals being deposited as fossils. It doesn't happen. This doesn't happen. Do you know in the 19th century, there was a period in time in which men would travel on trains out to the western United States to kill buffalo. Buffalo herds were slaughtered by the millions of animals, and they were just allowed to lay in the, in the fields or in the, uh, the plains of the United States to die. They weren't taken for any good. It was just sport, kill and, and leave them. It was just target practice, basically. Millions of buffalo almost made them extinct, as you know. What happened to all of those animals? Do you know today there's no evidence of them? You can't find a single buffalo fossil. Why not? You would think after so many animals dying and being left on the ground that there'd be some record of their bodies in the ground. If fossilization is a common thing, it happens all the time, that would have been a perfect example in which to go find it at work. But it didn't happen. Why not? Because we know how animals actually die, don't we? <laughs> there isn't time for them to become fossils. They get eaten. They get worn away by weather. They get deteriorated by the sun. The bones break up and crumble. There's no fossilizing of animals by and large. It's a very hard thing to fossilize an animal. It's a very rare thing to fossilize an animal. In fact, there's only one way we know in which an animal can be fossilized. Only one way. The animal has to be quickly buried in mud. The only known way to take a living animal and fossilize it is to suddenly, catastrophically bury it in mud. Do we have anything in scripture that explains how millions of animals could be simultaneously captured in sedimentary rock, in mud, and thereby fossilized? Chapter 6 and 7 of Genesis says that's exactly what happened. And furthermore, the story of Genesis and the flood of Noah would be consistent with what we see in the record of the geologic column. Layers and layers of sedimentary rock deposited simultaneously with certain animals dying first, animals in the sea and lower animals that couldn't escape the waters, followed by larger animals who were more likely to survive at least some short period of time, and in the settling out of all of these things were on the top layers of the deposits. However, that's not a perfect kind of process. It's going to vary a little. In some parts of the earth, they might be on the bottom. In other parts of the earth, they're all mixed together. That's exactly what we find in the column. Not perfect, not like it's idealized, but consistent with what you would see with the churning and the force that would have to be there with a giant flood in which the entire earth was covered in water and all the sediment with it flowing around, muddy, swirling water. And then as the water recedes into the basins of the ocean, which is what God said he did to remove it from the earth, as he lowered the floors of the oceans to give more room for the water, and the water naturally flowed off into those basins, it deposited neatly everything on the ground underneath mud. And because of that method, they were all nicely fossilized. It's the only way we know what happens. You see, if you go to the science of the earth, or go to the natural observations of the earth, and you conduct science with an objective mind, you find plenty of evidence for what the Bible says happened. And conversely, nothing else makes sense. No other explanation works. And every other attempt shows itself to be false by its internally contradictory views. So let's finish on this. Dating is either unreliable or it's impossible in the way it's portrayed. Column ages were contrived. They were not determined scientifically. Fossils are dated by the column while the column is dated by the fossil. And fossils only form when buried quickly. They cannot form over long periods of time. But the literature and the media and popular culture would tell you that that's the truth. 
for the moment, I want to show you that in, there is a way to conduct science in the natural world in a sound way, at least to a degree, to the degree we can, and demonstrate by it that the story in creation is actually consistent with what we see in the world around us. For example, there, is ways you, there are ways you can determine the age of the earth or approximate the age of the earth that are sound to a degree, as, as much as possible. Remember we said evolution needs time, lots of time. If we could go into the world and find ways to measure the age of the earth, and as I do that work, as I come to the earth and I do some, some, some sort of measurement that I can trust at some level, if I come back with an estimate that the earth is a billion years old, if I have a way of measuring, and that measurement reports back that the Earth is no more than a billion years old, I've just set an upper limit, haven't I? Maybe the Earth is less, but I've proven it can't be more than some date. Or if I come in and I do another measurement, and another measurement comes back and it says, no, this process could not have been happening longer than 100 million years. Well, now I've set an upper limit for the Earth's age of 100 million. Doesn't matter that I had another measurement at an earlier point that said it could have been as long as a billion. Now this new measurement sets an upper limit of 100 million. And on and on and on. So is there evidence in the world that I can point to that would tell you that the world, the world has an upper limit, that it's actually not as old as we think it is because there's data that says it simply can't be any older than this because of what we can observe in the world. And yes, there are. There's quite a bit. We can look at the moon's distance from the Earth. That's a very easy thing to measure now that we have a reflector that we put out there when the men went to the Earth. We can shine a laser beam off that reflector and it bounces back to the Earth. We can time that with precision, with precision and we can see exactly how far the Earth is from the moon. What we discovered when we did that was that the moon is receding four centimeters a year. Every year the moon is four centimeters farther away from the earth than it was the year before. And that's a constant rate and it's continued to do that ever since we began measuring it. Now we know based on physics that that rate is slowing as it moves. You know how if you take a rock and you put it on a string and you spin it, the shorter the, the string the faster you have to spin it. As you make the rock, as you make the string longer, the slower you can turn it, right? Well, as the moon moves further away, that gravitational force weakens, and so the, the, the speed of that recession is slowing. So we know that it's not always been the pace it is now, but we can calculate how that change would have occurred just using simple physics. So if the moon is receding today at that rate, and we can calculate how that rate would have changed over time, I can just do the math backwards, right? I can say, well, how close was it to the Earth 10 years ago or a million years ago? And if I do the math, the oldest the moon could be is 1.5 billion years old. That's the oldest it could be. Why do I know that? Because if it was any older than that, it would be so close to the Earth that it would create so much gravitational pull that the Earth would melt. So that's the oldest it could possibly be, and as far as we can understand, it would still allow for the Earth and the moon to exist together. Now, that's not how old it is necessarily, it's the oldest. So immediately, I have an upper limit. Forget what they tell you about the Earth being four and a half billion years old. This fact all by itself says it can't be older than 1.4 billion years old. Now, what assumption am I making? Uniformitarianism. Now, you might say, well, you just told us that's not a very good assumption, Steve. And it isn't. But remember, I'm using the same assumptions they're using. If they're using that assumption to arrive at certain dates, and I use the same assumption, and I come to a much younger date, and we're using the same assumptions, then by definition, they have to cap the age at the date I've found. So that Casio example again. Now, we, both, we might both be wrong, but my point is, if we're going to use their rules and come up with a lower date, they have to observe that date, logically speaking. So we've already cut the age of the Earth to something far less than evolution would say it is, but we can go further. We're going to move the scale here. Let's keep track of where we go. How about helium? You know there's helium in our atmosphere? You're breathing helium all the time. You're, not, you're just not breathing enough of it to get your voice into that squeaky high-pitched range that we do with the balloons, right? Radioactive decay of uranium and thorium in the atmosphere, sort of like carbon-14 decaying, well, these elements also decay. They decay into helium, but the thing about helium is it's a noble gas. You all remember this? Getting into your chemistry history here, right? What does a noble gas do? Nothing. <laughs> It's completely stable. Helium, once it's helium, never goes to anything else. It will forever be helium, unless somebody causes it to take a chemical reaction. But it's, it's noble, it's inert. So once something becomes helium, you've forever got it in the atmosphere. Nothing ever gets rid of it. 
So helium is building all the time in the atmosphere. It's never going away, and it's always, always more of it is being made. Well, if the concentration of helium in the atmosphere is increasing, and it's increasing at a very stable fixed rate, the rate is the same year to year to year to year. You see an opportunity to date the Earth? Just do the math backwards and say, okay, if it's at a certain concentration now and it's developing every day, how far back in time do I have to go to where there is none? Right? To where it started at zero and started forming in the atmosphere. If you calculate backward, the max age of the Earth is two million years old. That at the current rate of production, it took two million years to get as much helium as we have right now in the Earth. Now, am I using uniformitarianism again? Absolutely. But as I said already, their assumptions, we're just applying them to other observations. And here are the data we get. So now, the upper limit for the age of the Earth is two million years old. It can't be older based on how helium is produced naturally in the, in the atmosphere. The Earth's magnetic field, have you heard about this? There's been some things in the, in the, in the literature, in the, even in, the, in CNN and in the paper in the last couple of years about this. It's kind of interesting stuff. The, the magnetic field of the Earth has a half-life. In other words, at a predictable rate, the strength of our magnetic field is diminishing. And every 1,400 years, which isn't very long, Every 1,400 years, it's half as strong as it was at the beginning of that time. It's losing half its strength every 1,400 years. Well, that's a serious issue because the magnetic field of the Earth is what protects us from many of the dangerous, harmful rays that come from the sun. At the current rate of its diminishment, the age of the Earth couldn't be more than 10,000 years old. How do we know that? Because if it's diminishing now, and I just reverse that, and I say, okay, how far back can you go in strengthening it? Well, there's a limit there, because if you strengthen the magnetic field too much, you get too much magnetic flow. How, what happens if you take a lot of electricity and move it through some kind of conductor? A lot of electricity. What happens to the conductor? It gets very hot, right? Well, the magnetic flow through the Earth produces a certain amount of energy or, or transfers a certain amount of heat to the Earth. That's where we believe, that's where some scientists believe that the heat of the core of the, er of, the, of the Earth is actually being produced by the flow of the magnetic field through the Earth, heating it up. If I increase that flow of electrons, at some point I get so much energy flowing through the Earth that the Earth melts. So there's an upper limit to how strong the magnetic field can be. And if I calculate how strong that is at this rate of decay, I can only go back about 10,000 years. At 20,000 years, the Earth is melted. Well, now I've got a real limit, don't I? Now, I'm saying that the max age for the Earth is 20,000 years, and that's being generous. That's assuming melting Earth. Well, now we're way outside of the range of anything that evolution could use. We're talking about an Earth that's very, very young, relative to what evolutionists would say. How do they explain that? Or should I ask, how do they explain that away? They say that uniformitarianism does not apply to the, uh, the magnetic field of the Earth, that it goes in cycles, that it has increased in the past and then decreased in this current phase, but sooner or later it will reverse again and start to increase again. How do they know that? They don't. Why do they say that then? Because they need it to be true. So it's interesting, isn't it? When the observations of the world fit their proposed theories, they accept them on the face of it. When the observations of the natural world do not fit the theories, they explain it away. In the first case, they adopt uniformitarianism. In the second case, they dismiss uniformitarianism. On what basis do they do one versus the other? Not on any scientific basis, just on the basis of how it fits what they want to believe. How about mineral concentrations in the ocean? There's nearly 500 million tons of sodium entering the oceans every year from the runoff of the earth through, ocean, through rivers that then empty into the ocean. So they're carrying sediment, they're carrying salts from the earth, and they're depositing that in the ocean. Why is the ocean salty? Because of this process. And that's a continuing process. So only 27% of the salt that enters the ocean every year is lost through natural processes. So the bulk of the salts that enter the ocean every year are staying there. Well, Obviously then, the, earth, the, salt, uh, the um, oceans of the Earth are getting saltier every year on a very predictable rate. You can see from a satellite image how that, that murkiness you see around the coastline there is a, evidence of how that sediment is seeping out from the Earth and going into the oceans. All right, well, let's just do the math again. You calculate backward. If the Earth is 
the salt waters today are salty because salt came from the earth and it's increasing. If I reverse that and go backwards in time, I'm going back to a time when the water of the oceans was salt free, right? Theoretically. How far back do I have to go at the current rates to get to salt free water in the oceans? 10,000 years. And that's assuming, by the way, that we started with salt free water. I'm not saying we did, but I'm saying you can't go any further back than that if you assume uniformitarianism. So now we're at 10,000 years. <laughs> So the Oxford Dictionary says it's a gradual process that con continues for three billion years, but s observations of the natural world don't allow us to go to that limit of time. It starts it limiting us at around 10,000 years. How long does the Bible say we've been, according to the best estimates of the genealogies given in Genesis? 6, About 6,000 years. How long is the millennial kingdom? 1,000. 1,000. Wouldn't it be just like God to have a 6,000 year period followed by a 1,000 year period before the earth itself is destroyed and replaced? That's not proof of anything, but my point is that the Bible is lining up, not only in descriptions of the world, but also in the theology of the Bible with what the natural world can show us if we observe it with, with an open mind, as opposed to with a preconceived notion. Generally speaking, these are, these are the things we think about most when we think of evolution, and this is where the world seems to challenge us the most. This idea that animals are evolving and changing. This idea that we evolved from monkeys and that there has been proof found in the fossil record to support these two conclusions. Well, let's look at it. First, natural selection. You notice in the definition, it says it's a gradual process, but we said, no, it's not. Life arose, no, not really. It's three billion years old, no, not really. It's been continuing for all that time. No, we've never seen it. Um, but it started with the earliest and most primitive organisms. Well. Do we know anything about that? Can we go see? This, this is a way of depicting the morphology of, evo of evolution. It says everything started with something that became other things. And over time, some died out, and then others continued on. So you have one object that began, one life form that began everything. Sometimes it went extinct. Sometimes it continued on to today. That's the morphology that is proposed by evolution. What kind of evolution are we talking about, though? Because the engine for that change, they would argue, is death, natural selection through death, but there are terms here we need to clarify because when someone tells you, well, look, you can see animals changing in the world around you in keeping with the environment, that's proof that natural selection takes place. How can you deny that? Well, the problem is we're talking about two different things. There's microevolution and there is macroevolution. Well, what's the difference? Well, microevolution is a variation of an animal within its kind in keeping with what God says in Genesis chapter 1. Within its kind, no new genetic information is required. And this is very common in nature. For example, the DNA of these two animals are very, very closely linked. In fact, it's easy to see in the DNA that they came from a common ancestor. Now, they have split from one another so far in the genetic record that they can't go back together anymore. You might think of it like this. If I gave um, you the full DNA required for every canine, and then in the course, I mean, you're a canine in other words, and in the course of, of reproduction, you continue to reproduce after your own kind, but then pockets of that, of your family, so to speak, s move out into different regions of the earth and start to breed within themselves a little bit, and furthermore, they break off from there. Over time, that splitting up of the, of the groups of individuals within the whole starts to allow for some natural selection to take place and the DNA starts to be split and modified based on the, the, the mating that takes place within those smaller groups and some DNA information may be lost through genetic defects, through mutations within the, the DNA. The original DNA is devolving, not evolving, devolving. And if that goes on long enough, some of those pockets become uh, so different from where they started with the others that they can no longer mate together. They're going to be different enough that they're no longer compatible. Or maybe they're compatible, they just look very different. They all had a common ancestor, and the DNA has not improved, it's devolved. All the original DNA, though, was there in the beginning to allow for these two expressions to take place. The, the term in geology, or in uh, genetics, rather, is the phenotype of the genotype. The genotype is your DNA information. The phenotype is the way you look. So I have brown eyes or I have brown hair. That's my phenotype. But behind that is a gene causing that. That's my genotype. And all the genetic information that was necessary for me to have brown eyes and brown hair was in my genes and in my father, my mother, and so on. 
but there is no genetic information to cause me to be a giraffe. It's just not there. No matter how often my, my parents or any other human beings com combine to create children, they'll never be able to introduce new DNA. They only have to work with what they've got. God produced animals with certain kind, and within that kind, there was enough genetic programming to allow for some diversity, but not for them to create new information. Here's what macroevolution is. Macroevolution acknowledges that microevolution does happen, because it does, but then says, if that can happen, well then maybe that evolution, can, that, that selection process can go on far enough that you get from monkey to human. You see, the first instance, microevolution, that's true, and that's <laughs> observable in, in, in nature. This second form of evolution, though, it's proposed. It's theory. It's never been observed, never been measured, never been seen to happen, and we don't even have a mechanism for how it could happen. But we say it's possible. So we say there is micro, then the evolutionists say there is macro, but here's the trick. In order to go from micro to macro, you have to have the introduction of new, healthy genetic information into the DNA. Somehow, the DNA of a, of a monkey, let's say, has to see new information show up somewhere along the way and reprogram that animal's DNA to include new information that makes it into a human. That's the only way to get there. Before that happens, it only has enough information for itself, for reproducing after its own kind. So the instrument of macroevolution, according to evolutionists, is some way in which new information shows up in our DNA. Now you would think that would be something they'd want to go prove, right? To go show evidence of happening somewhere in nature. There's never been an observed case of that happening in nature, not once. But that's the essential requirement if, if macroevolution is going to be possible. So how does natural selection really work? Let me just give you a simple example. It's survival of the fittest, which I just described a minute ago. Remember the finches? That was your example of microevolution. In the finch DNA, there is enough, the genotype of a finch includes a wide variety of phenotypes when it comes to the beak. A finch can have a flat, I mean, a, a squat short beak or a long thin beak. That's already in the DNA. What causes it to express one over the other? The environment, in the way we already talked about, right? <laughs> That's what Darwin observed. What Darwin did, though, is he said, I see that working. I wonder if that can go on long enough and far enough that it causes finches to turn into frogs or whatever. That's the part of the theory that's unproven and that is a leap in logic from what we did observe, which is microevolution. It's also been applied to bacteria. You know, we talk about viruses evolving and changing and bacteria evolving and changing. Absolutely, they do. But does a virus or a bacteria turn into a protozoa or a worm? Or, no, in other words, again, they remain what they are. They just express differently what's already available in their DNA based on what they see in the environment. One of the most famous examples comes from London. That's a picture of the bark of a tree. Can you see the moth on it? Well, hopefully not too well because the whole point is the moth has in its DNA a coloring uh, program that lets it adapt its colors to the environment it's in so that it can hide from birds that want to eat it. Now, in that DNA, it has the ability to, to change color. Not an individual moth. I mean, once the moth is born, it's going to stay that color. But its offspring have the ability to be a variety of colors, just like you see with farm animals. You can be spotted or it can be solid color and so on. If that moth reproduces and, and creates a solid black moth or a, a speckled moth on a black tree, it just became a target for a bird, didn't it? So in the way natural selection works, when that moth gave birth to all black, going back to the prior example, when it gave birth to an all black offspring and that all black offspring sat on one of those speckled branches of birch tree, it didn't live long enough to reproduce. So that natural selection produced a preponderance of speckled moth and very few of the other ones, just because the other ones didn't live. And that was part of how natural selection changes the look of the, of the animal. But in the 19th century, in the 18th century, 19th century, uh, coal became the popular way of heating homes in London. And coal puts out a very dirty, sooty smoke. And that soot settles on everything in the city. And London, at the end of the 19th century, was basically black. The buildings were black, the ground was black, and the trees became black. And all of a sudden, these spotted moths on black trees became targets for birds. 
What do you think happened very quickly in the reproduction of that moth? Suddenly, they all became black. Meaning, the offspring that were born black lived, and the offspring that were born white spotted didn't live, and so natural selection took its course and started to change the look. Where did the information come from to cause that change in, in the animal? It was always there in the DNA. That's microevolution. God's plan for how the, the survival of animals will take place in a changing environment. It's a marvelous plan of God, and it's built into our DNA. So that is the way natural selection really works. There are two other methods very quickly. There's genetic recombination. That's the basic process in which a mom and a dad come together, and their genes mix, and they create something out of that mix. That's the normal way in which we see genetic material altering, but again, only within the limits of what's already present in DNA. By the way, they've tried to replicate this to the point of introducing new genetic information in keeping with the theory of macroevolution, and they've never been able to make it happen. And then there are the abnormal mutations. Um, exposing someone to too much radiation can actually alter the DNA of their body's cells, but never in a healthy way. It destroys information. It does not create information. Healthy genes go bad. New genes do not appear. And so there is no way, if anyone's ever suggested to you that, well, there can be mutations in genes, and that's how we get new information. Never happens. Never been observed, never been forced to happen in the laboratory. It just doesn't happen that way. They've tried to take tsetse flies, which reproduce very quickly, so they can do lots of trials on these things, and they subject them to high doses of radiation to see what would come from them. Could they mutate them into something better. And all they get is flies with one wing and flies with eight legs and flies with no eyes and you know, genetic defects causing the, lo the loss of abilities, not the growing of new things that are healthy or useful. So they've never been able to make that happen. So microevolution results in things always remaining within their kind. Macroevolution has never been witnessed and never been made to happen in a laboratory setting. And yet that is the instrument of evolution. That is the means by which higher orders arrive from lower orders. A living cell has irreducible complexity. You ever heard this before? A cell is a very complex thing. You ever seen one? In the sense of seeing it on a, on a screen somewhere? A living cell maintains itself with the harmonious cooperation of many organelles. If only one of these organelles fails to function, the cell cannot remain alive. The cell does not have the chance to wait for unconscious mechanisms like natural selection or mutation to permit it to develop. Thus, the first cell on Earth was necessarily a complete cell processing all the required organelles and functions, and this definitely means the cell had to have been created. Another way to say it is, if you look at the complexity of the human cell, or any single cell, it has such irreducible complexity that there is no way it could have evolved to the point of its own existence. Another way to say it, very simply, is if I gave you a human cell and you could look at it, it's such a complex factory of stuff. If I turn off any one of the little pieces that are inside it, the whole thing dies instantly. How did it evolve to being alive? The only way it got to the point of being alive is if everything in it was there from day one, already functioning, ready to go. It couldn't have evolved from lower states because lower states aren't life. It's an all or nothing proposition. It's irreducibly complex. Evolution doesn't have an answer for how that could have happened. The ascent of man, right? So when we look at what they claim is true about the fossil record with respect to man, they claim that there are these examples of older forms of man, early versions of man, something that connects us to the animal kingdom in terms of the apes, something that connects us to them, right? They call them hominids, forms of man-like creatures. These fossils, when you look at each one that's been claimed, they generally fall within the range of either normal human variation or they match closely existing primates. What I'm saying is they're either finding dead humans or they're finding dead monkeys. Well, wait a minute. Aren't there something in between? Isn't that what they've been preaching all these years, that there's, a, there's, Ill, there's steps in between? How did I ever get to the point of suggesting there were steps in between? Remember the opening slide? If I take monkeys of different heights and put them in a row and put man at the end, the point's made without even having to say a word, isn't it? But they're all monkeys until you get to the last one. Or maybe the next to last one was an ancient man whose appearance is just a little different than yours and mine. Remember that natural variation we talked about within the DNA, that there could be an evolutionary effort, microevolutionary effort, that causes some distinctions in appearance, but yet it's all coming from the same genetic code, and therefore it's all humans, 
They're just not humans that look as much like we do today. So you have those natural, remember there's a range in every human. I'm taller than some people. There's other people here that are, that are you know, different eye color, different hair color. My eyes are closer together than some people's and farther apart than others. And all of these variations have a range, right? We have humans on the low end of the scale of height and humans on the high end. We have some humans that are barely two and a half feet tall and some humans that are eight feet tall. That's a lot of variation. Most of us are somewhere in the middle. But the human DNA has a lot of range for variation in skull size, in brow protrusions, in jaw size. These are within the range of what we can find even today in the world around us. But if I want to make a story, I can take some of those that live on the edges of that range and claim that they're not actually human. That was a monkey. But not really a monkey either. It was something in between. It was moving in the direction of mankind. And then I give it a really fancy name and a story around it and an artist's conception and I've got you hooked. Let me show you what I mean. Artist conceptions are used to fill in the gaps and to force a conclusion. I'll give you some examples. There's the fossil that's found. There's the artist's conception. Now, if I showed that to you, this is a real life fossil that's found. This is truly an example of one that's been proposed as one of those links between man and monkey. If I just showed you that picture, the one on the bottom, and I asked you, what is that creature? What would you say? You'd say it's a monkey, an ape, a primate. Now, if I went a step further and I said, actually, that particular monkey doesn't exist today. I think it, it's not found in the world today. It's, it's extinct. Does that change your opinion of it? There's carrier pigeons that are extinct. There's dodo birds that are extinct. Does that say anything about what they mean to us? They're just a version of that morphology that died out somewhere along the line. But does it say anything about where you came from inherently? No. It's a dead, extinct monkey. But if I put a conception, artist's conception around it and put on either side of it other monkeys and then put you at the very end of that line, what am I implying? More than implying, what am I claiming? That you came from that animal. Transitory forms, this is, this is the term they use for these animals that are extinct in the fossil record but they claim have some relationship to us. Transitory forms are suggested by this careful juxtapositioning of the fossil record in these pictures I'm talking about. The way they lay them out. So that Many hoaxes, that is one way in which this works. The other way in which this works is there are a lot of hoaxes in the textbooks and remain in the textbooks even today that have never been exterminated, never been expunged from the record and yet continue to be there to try to argue for this process of movement from apes to man. And then in between all of this, you've got guesswork and wishful thinking replacing science again, just like we've seen all along. Let me show you some examples. There was Java Man in 1891. They found this skull. On the island of Java, the skull cap, here's what they found. They claimed that this is from a hominid, not quite ape, not quite human, the missing link kind of thing again. They drew an artist's conception. Isn't that interesting? They made that guy out of that head, that skull cap. I don't know how they knew how he had hair all over his body, but somehow that came out of the artist's conception looking at a skull cap. But when you look at the skull cap itself, it falls squarely within the range of human variation. In other words, could it have been a monkey? It could have, but it would have been the largest monkey ever found because it's, in terms of a, a normal framed uh, skull, it is perfectly within the range of normal human skulls. Now what's different about it is it has a particular protrusion on the front of the cap that's more than what you often see today and that's why you see the, the protruding uh, eyebrows on this artist's conception. That would have been there, but have you ever run into anybody with a particularly protruding brow? Yes, they're out there. That's well within the range of normal human variation. It's not an exception, it's, it's consistent with humans. So they find the skull cap of a dead man and they claim with an artist's conception that it's Java man. Then there was 1912, Piltdown man. Piltdown was a place in Sussex, England. They found this jaw and the rest of it, the white part there is actually made up. I mean, they just filled in the gaps, right? All they found was the jaw and a little piece of the skull on top. They sure did take a lot of liberty with the rest of it though, didn't they? Here's the artist's conception. Piltdown man. Turned out to be a complete hoax. It was an orangutan jaw. It's documented in the literature now as a hoax, and yet there are still school textbooks that talk about Piltdown man as one of the missing links. This was perpetrated as a hoax. It took 40 years for them to uncover that the scientists who perpetrated this had actually constru constructed this as a hoax. So you have Piltdown man and Nebraska man. You all remember, I don't know if you've heard about this one. This is one of my favorites. 1922 in Nebraska. What did they find? Teeth. Guess what the artist's conception was? 
from the teeth. Guess what the teeth were? An extinct pig. They've, now this was not a hoax, this was, in other words, they didn't intentionally try to mislead, but they looked at these teeth, made some wild assumptions, created the, 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 the artist's drawing. I found a tooth, this is it, let's go with it, run with it. Until someone did some better analysis on the tooth and the DNA of the tooth. Remember 1922, that's prior to the discovery of DNA. By the time DNA had come along, they discovered, uh, this is pig DNA. Then there's Neanderthal man. This is the one that you still hear about in the news today. Neanderthal man. Here's a Neanderthal skull. Interesting, yeah? On the left is a human skull found in the, in typically what you'd see today. On the right is a Neanderthal skull. They are different. But they're still within the range of normal human variation. It's just a variation that you don't find in the world today. It's like a, a, like a hair color that's died out, or a eye color that's no longer found. It's, just, it's like a language that's died out. It is within normal variation, it's just not represented today. It's an extinct variation, if you will, within what's possible in human DNA. So if I look at that and I say, well, what kind of people might look like that if they had that kind of construction in their skull today? Well, the artists have done this. How do I get the big fat nose? How do I get the hairy body? And why is he only wearing bearskin? That doesn't follow naturally just because he had that shaped skull. But it certainly feeds the myth, doesn't it? Why does he have to have a stick in his hand? You know, as if he didn't have... And why is he buck naked? You see a little mythology being built into the depiction of the artist, right? Feeds the myth, feeds the thought. Ancient, you know, man, crude. Not human. This can't be us. This is not human. Oh, wait a minute now. If you saw that guy walking down the streets of, let's say, a Middle Eastern country where you might be more likely to see some of these features... Would you step back off the sidewalk in horror and scream, Neanderthal man? I mean, is that an appearance that would drive you to think this is something unhuman? Kind of looks like a guy that you might meet today, doesn't it? Here's what they think the children look like. I mean, his eyes are a little further apart than some kids you see today, but otherwise that's a pretty good looking boy. But that's a fair representation from what the structures of the, of the skull would leave in the face of someone who was a Neanderthal. Here's an article. Scientists sequence the Neanderthal gene. This is just very recently. This is um, 2010. It says, a decade after scientists first cracked the human genome, scientists announced in May, in the in May issue of Science, that Neanderthals existed roughly 400,000 to 30,000 years ago. How do they know that? Not by carbon dating, by speculation. When, when their closest relatives, early humans, may have driven them to extinction. In fact, it says, if you go down here to the bottom, genetic information turned up some intriguing findings that at some point, after early humans migrated out of Africa, they mingled and mated with Neanderthals. In other words, the conclusion of the article is, when you look at Neanderthal DNA and you look at human DNA, we're so similar that they say we must have mated with them. Folks, Neanderthals are just humans. They're an ancient people, ancient in terms of, you know, thousands of years, who lived in what is present-day France, Normandy, France, basically, and they became so isolated from the rest of the human population of that age that they developed some unique physical characteristics that are well within the range of normal human variation. And when you look at fair representations of them, as we just did, they look like people. Why doesn't that work for the scientific community? Because it doesn't feed the theory. It fits better to say they fall somewhere between us and apes. And how do we reinforce that thinking in the populace's mind? By making artist conceptions that make them look non-human. But it doesn't fit the data. How about Cro-Magnon Man? You've heard of him? He was discovered in 1868. Here's his skull. It's even more like humans than Neanderthal. More, more like modern humans than Neanderthal is. It's almost a dead ringer for current day human skulls. You got a little more protrusion on the brow. Same cranial volume basically as us. Could have a brain of equal size as us. Here's how he's depicted. If I showed you as a seven or eight or nine year old kid in grade school this picture, you've left with an indelible image in your mind that we came from apes. Here's another artist's conception of what Cro-Magnon Man would have looked like. Look at what they've taken liberties with. Look how wide the nose is. The cartilage there, that's not a, that's not a given. Based on the structure of the bone, it doesn't automatically result in a wide nose. Uh, my skull, your skull, your skull didn't drive the size of our noses, right? That's something in addition to the skull structure of our, of our brain. That's another aspect of our DNA. That man could have been driven, or, or drawn rather, with a nose that was far more normal looking. They just chose to put a very ape-like nose on his face, right? 
And of course, they gave him the protruding brow, which was a feature of that skull, but again, it's within the range of normal human variation. It's not abnormal in that respect. My point is, Cro-Magnon man would look like a human being if you walked down the street right now, because he was. So when I look at the fossil record, and the most famous one we'll talk about now is Lucy, when I look at the fossil record, I keep finding these examples of creatures that are clearly within the range of normal variation for apes or, or primates and others that are clearly within the range of normal variation for humans. But because we're looking for something to prove the two came from a single ancestor, we position them in the popular culture and in the scientific literature as stages of development when there's nothing to suggest that by the mere fact that they existed, by their mere fossil record. Lucy is the one you hear the most about, right? Do you know why you hear the most about him? Because Leakey was the one who discovered him. Who's Leakey? He's from the most famous fan uh, family of anthropologists, and so he's like the rock star of this area of science, and whatever Leakey says goes. So when Leakey made his discovery, it was heavily promoted, heavily um, supported, and so in other words, he had the the, the ability to promote and market his finding to such a great degree that it became very widely known in the culture. This is what he found. That's the artist's conception of the skeleton that he found. Now, if I took that conception, and instead of having it stand on two feet like they've proposed in that picture, if instead I had it down on all fours like that earlier model of the monkey, when you look at that, would you call that a human or call it a monkey? You'd clearly say that's a primate. It looks exactly like a primate. It's a little different than any we have today because it's an extinct one, but it's well within the range of primate. There's nothing about its mere existence to suggest that we came from it. But if I make it stand up, I start to suggest things, right? I start to suggest it's evolving. When there's no evidence that it did, it's an it's extinct ape. So when I put that on the screen and then I tell you a story you come away convinced that science has proven something that has never been proven and it can't be proven. Here's another way I do that. This is a shot taken out of a, a science um, book. That is a, the one on the left is an orangutan. The one on the right is modern human. The one in the middle, supposed ancient missing link. Which one does it look like? Looks, looks like the human. It's well within the range of normal human variation. Almost identical, it's just a little bigger, the teeth are more pronounced in the front, but it's within the range of normal variation. You ever seen some people with bigger teeth and a mouth where they stick out a little bit more? This is what Time Magazine does. About every six months, like clockwork, they had a story like this. Whether there was anything new in the news to talk about or not, if you read them half the time they weren't talking about anything new, it was just a recap of old stuff. But it's like they have this program in which they know every six months we've got to reinforce the orthodoxy. We've got to come back with this story, and look what they do in their covers. This is that juxtaposition thing I talked about, right? I put the monkey face next to the baby face. What am I telling you? We came from the monkey. Does that prove anything? No. And if you look into the story of what they say happened, no, it's the recapitulation of all this same stuff over and over and over again. No proof, no evidence, nothing provable, nothing observable. So what is the creation's view of that morphology? We agree that there's been some... Um, oh, you're just stretching, right? <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> We agree and we recognize that there has been extinctions, that there are variations in kind, that from a canine can come over time a fox and a hound because, or a, a wolf because the original canine had the capacity in their DNA for that kind of diversity. But there are some hard lines. Kinds don't jump. So kinds remain within their type. They diversify only as much as God has permitted in their DNA and sometimes they die out. That's the observable world, and that's consistent with Scripture. What has never been observed and cannot be proven is that these things jump and create one from another, and yet that is what evolution maintains. We're going to end on this. I could have spent another half the day talking about how the second law of thermodynamics prohibits the kind of upward gains of complexity that evolution says, Thermal, second law of thermodynamics says entropy, that energy moves from higher states to lower states, more complex to less complex. You see this in your everyday life. Your car gets worse, it doesn't get better. Your house gets dirtier, it doesn't get cleaner. Your body wears out, it doesn't get better. Everything in your life is going from higher states of order to lower states of order. But evolution claims the opposite is a natural force. The second law of thermodynamics says it's impossible. 
Energy must be added in order to increase complexity, and there's no source for that energy in the way the natural world works. Statistical chance, you can do mathematical models of what are the chances that DNA could recombine in such a way that it could come up with new information. And the, the math is so astronomical, you'd be better off playing the lottery every day than believing in evolution. You'd be more likely to win. That irreducible complexity issue we kind of skipped over. And symbiotic relationships, that's a really interesting one. In nature, you find symbiotic relationships where certain creatures can't exist unless another creature also exists at the same time because they need each other to survive. You can't get there through an evolutionary model because the chances of two things evolving identically in the same place at the same time and then dependent upon one another are astronomical. I like to think also about this issue in, in when it comes to natural selection. If you happen to evolve in within your type to some point that you have an offspring that is fundamentally different than you were to begin with, how is that new offspring going to reproduce unless somebody else in the same area has another one of exactly the same type at about the same time? Otherwise, it's just some kind of strange mutation that dies out on its own. The whole process doesn't make sense if you think about it. <laughs> so we've gone through the scientific method, and what we're left with is you can't test, you can't observe, you only have the theory. So what do we make then of the conclusion today? <laughs> If you have any doubts, you have any questions, you want to go further, here are some good creation resources, and I'll, you'll be able to get to this later, I'm sure, from the recording. And for the flip side, if you wanted to see what the world is teaching on evolution, PBS is a good source, by the way, or some of these references. So which came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> which of these... Well, I mean, based on our theory, which one would come first? Well, based on our, I'm saying, based on the theory of evolution, which one would come first? The chicken would have to come first. We know that happened because that's how God created. But even the theory of evolution would have to come to that same conclusion. In fact, because they haven't found any transitory forms in the fossil record, they can't find this animal that's halfway between two existing animals. They just can't find those. And that's what Darwin said bothered him so much. His theory predicts that, and you can't find any. Then they have come now to the point of saying, they call something, um, they have a theory they've called the hopeful monster theory. That's exactly what it's called. It proposes that literally, in one fell swoop, an animal gives birth to something wholly different than itself. That's why you don't see any transitory forms. And therefore, from that moment onward, something new exists that can then reproduce forward. And of course, they don't have any mechanism to explain how something could make such a leap, but that's, that's why they call it the hopeful monster theory, that there is this moment in time somewhere along the way where, unbeknownst to why, with no reason why, suddenly a chicken gives birth to a, to a pig. I mean, that's being silly because it wouldn't work, but a chicken gives birth to a swan or something that comes out of the egg. They're fundamentally different than the mom. That's how far the theory has gone now to try to make do with the data that's available. And which takes more faith? Believing that or believing what God's word says? So thank you for the time. I Grace Chapel is a non-denominational church focused on the Christian fellowship of believers in an environment committed to teaching the entire counsel of God. Grace Chapel teaches verse by verse through the Bible on Sunday mornings at 9.45 a.m. and on Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. For more information on Grace Chapel, feel free to visit our website, www.gracechapeltelahoma.com or call 931-581-3294.